Let's all stand together as we sing.
for us to be together tonight. We thank you for the privilege that we have of coming as the body of Christ in unity to lift our voices in praise to you and to worship you. We pray that uh, what we have just sung would be the prayer of our heart and all, uh, all we do help us honor you. We thank you again for this time to be here and we pray that your word would impact our lives as we hear spoken. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Um, just recently, 
Lori Bateman, who's been working as the worship assistant here at the church, had decided to retire, something to do with grandkids, I think, something like that. You may have heard Steve talk about them a little bit. And so uh, she has retired from that position, and we have been very blessed to have Emily Williquit taking over that position. So it's a joy to be working with Emily. And at this time, Emily is going to uh, share a piano piece with us. feel calm right now. I don't know about you. It is so good that the Lord has added Emily to our team, and we're glad to have her and uh, look forward to what the Lord's going to do through her and her ministry here. Um, so in your handout, you'll just notice we'll probably kind of look at this chart a little bit each time, and then I want to kind of give you a uh, um, roadmap of where we're going in the next uh, few weeks together. So at, at the top, what we're talking about is the process of sanctification, of growing in our holiness, pressing on to holiness. I was talking about it as a struggle. It's an uphill battle a lot, of, a lot of times, so we need all the help we can get. So God has given us these graces, the, these, these gifts that he's given to us to help us along the way, the means of grace, uh, where, uh, and one of them is just each other. 
being together as the church. This is helping us in our, in our fight for holiness, just being together to close the Lord's Day out together on a Sunday evening. Um, it's not a big show. It's just the family of God getting together around His Word, singing some songs together, praise to the Lord, and then asking Him to be gracious to us. We need His help, and we need each other. And the way He does that is uh, He gives us so many gifts to do that, and fellowship is, is one of the ones that's just, it's, it, you can't do without it. So what we're going to do is tonight, talk about January 20th, we're going to talk about God, who is the standard of holiness. We're going to talk about the holiness of God here in a few minutes. And then um, next week, we'll look at specifically at Jesus himself, the model of holiness. And why this is so important is because uh, Jesus uh, had human flesh, and so he really uh, shows us, okay, well, what about this situation? What does it look like in that situation? How, what does it mean to be holy? I think we have a lot of um, misconstrued ideas about what it means to be holy, about who, what Jesus was actually like. There are a lot of stereotypes about Jesus, so next week might be a little surprising for you. And then we want to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit and the power for holiness and how He enables us, and that'll be February 3rd. On the 10th, we're going to talk about discipline and the habits of holiness, and then strategy on the 17th, the plan for holiness. So I hope you, what you see here is, uh, I want you to see what I'm doing. I want you to see the big picture is we're laying a, a, a groundwork, a doctrinal groundwork, but uh, we're, we're moving toward, just hang in there, okay, for the next few weeks because we're looking toward the next few weeks to toward the end uh, to get really, really practical, all right? And, and so on this doctrinal foundation, we're going to talk about our practice and our strategy and actually how to deal with temptation and that sort of thing. So uh, we'll give you specific things to think about in terms of a strategy for holiness. You've got to plan to be holy. You, it, it's just not going to, it's not going to happen without planning. Just like you've got to plan your finances, you've got to plan your holiness. And so we're going to talk about what that means. And then credibility, why the nations need our holiness, and that's going to set us up for the missions conference. J.D. Payne, who is a professor of missiology down at Sam, Samford University, uh, and prior to that, he was the missions director at the Church of Brook Hills in Birmingham. Looking forward to having J.D. here. He's got a Ph.D. in missiology, but don't let that scare you. He's got a good southern accent, so it's going to work out all right. And so he's, a, he's, bringing, he's going to bring some things, and he's young. That's another thing that's going to be helpful as well. So uh, that'll be our missions conference in uh, March, beginning uh, uh, March 1st, the 2nd and 3rd. All right, so that's the plan. Hang in there, and then we'll get, as I said, toward the end, we start to get very, very practical. I want to talk tonight about God, who is the standard of holiness on the, on the back page there. I want to make a distinction between, uh, I'm going to give you some terms here that we'll uh, hopefully be able to use in the future, so you'll know what I mean when I say that. Cultural holiness um, is, is the idea that you adapt to the character and the behavior of professing Christians around us. And so a lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm pretty holy. And the reason is they're comparing themselves to other Christians around them. And, and in different cultures, the church in different cultures is going to look different. And uh, the, the thing about that is what you end up comparing yourself to other people in the church, and you, you, it can, first of all, it can lead to pride. Uh, you say, hey, I'm holier than that guy. I mean, and you, you nudge your wife and say, at least I'm not that guy, you know. So I'm holier than he is. Or it might lead to despair because you look at some people in the church. I think sometimes people visit our church and they look around at the people and they think they know what they're like. And they think, man, I'll never be that holy. And that can be kind of discouraging. And uh, so that's not really uh, the standard. The standard is God. And so actual Actual holiness, true holiness, is when we adapt to the character and the behavior of God. So cultural holiness, the standard of holiness and, and ethical and moral integrity is right here. God's way up here. So, so we're not trying to adapt to what other people are like, but, but then we've got to know who God is. We've got to understand God, and we've got to study God. This is, this is the standard of holiness, and so we try to adapt to His character and His behavior. Now, but we've got to make a distinction here between incommunicable attributes and communicable attributes. And those are just really big words, and it's not that hard to understand, especially if you, have, if you work in the, the medical field. Uh, you know what a communicable disease is. A communicable, uh, communicable disease is a disease that you can communicate. You can share it with other people. It's an infect, you can infect someone else, all right? If uh, someone drinks from, in your family drinks from your, you got a cold and they drink from your glass, they might get a cold uh, or some other indirect way. So 
a communicable means that you can share it with someone else. You can get infected. And uh, then there are incommunicable traits of God, and those we cannot share with God. All right. So the incommunicable traits of God would be those character and behavior traits of God that we cannot adapt to because they belong only to God and never belong to us. For example, the attribute of eternality. God is eternal. He, there's never been a time when God didn't exist. Well, there's a time that I didn't exist. About 1958, I didn't. Somewhere in 1959, I started existing. And in 1960, I got born. But, and you can all say that as well. But God can't say that. God can't say whether well, there's a time when I was not. God is eternal. There's never a time when he was not. There will never be a time where he will not be. And, there, and he is eternally existing right now. So he's eternal. You'll never have that trait. I'll never have that trait. Not only that, he's infinite. He, he, he goes on forever. And he's independent. So, see, God can exist long before we ever existed. God was doing fine. Uh, but we're, we're dependent. God doesn't need us. We desperately need God. So we are dependent. He's independent. Um, God is unique. There's only one God. But there's many people. I mean, there's all kinds of people like me. Uh, human beings, fallen human beings, sinful human beings. So there, God is a one and only, the one and only God. He's immutable. That's a great old word. It just means unchanging. He, he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We change. We change in our attitudes. We change in our feelings. We change in our, uh, our points of view, our opinions, our political views. We evolve. We ch- but God never changes. He's always been the same. Omniscient mean, omniscience means he knows everything. Everything there is to know, he knows. Everything in the past, everything in the future, everything happening right now, everything going on in your mind. He knows you're thinking about New Orleans and how that thing turned out. He knows if you're thinking about whether going to be done in time to see Kansas City. Well, he knows. And then uh, the omnipotence of God means he, is, he can do anything that he wants. All right, now, that's, that's a real key qualifier. God can do anything he wants. You don't teach your children God can do anything because he can't. There's some things God can't do, and I've mentioned this to you before. God can't lie. God can't sin. Uh, God, God can't uh, break his promise. There are a lot of things God can't do, but he can always do anything he wants to do, whatever pleases him. Our God is in the heaven. He does whatever he pleases. All right, so that's his omnipotence. And his omnipresence means he's everywhere. You can't go anywhere where, there's, where God is not. Uh, I, I love, uh, was, it, was it 68? No. Maybe, I can't remember. 60, when was Apollo 8? Destin, when was Apollo 8? Oh, okay. It was early 60s. Okay, I thought, well, maybe, was, maybe I'm thinking the wrong one. When did, when did they, it was Christmas Eve. And they, uh, one, the astronauts opened up a Bible. as Apollo 8. Do you remember when that was, Larry? Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. <laughs> what year? <laughs> well, good. I, I, at least I had that part. Because what I've just, I just wanted to demonstrate how we are not omniscient. All right? So uh, the point is that, you know, I love it because the, you know, the Russian cosmonauts had just been up there just a few months before then and said, well, I've been up there and... Fi- well, that's the way Russian cosmonauts talk, they, like they're from Moulton. I've been up there, and, uh, and uh, I didn't see God, you know, as, as, as if that proves that there's no God. And then our guys go up there in Apollo 8, and they open up Genesis, and they take turns reading. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you can't go anywhere where God is not. You, you, you go to the deepest part of the sea or the highest mountain, you, you, you go, you know, you got to closet in your house. I've noticed a couple of houses being built in Decatur where they start with a safe house. It's that, that safe room. You know, they built that concrete block room first, and then they build everything around it. And you go in your safe, God's there. You can't hide from him. And so he's omnipresent. And, uh, and then absolute sovereignty means that he has total authority. If you have any authority, it's only because God gave it to you. Remember what, uh, what Jesus said to Pilate? He said, you know, let me just tell you something. He pays before Pilate, and Pilate says, don't you know who I am? Don't you know I have the power to do this and that? And Jesus says, well, let me just explain it to you. You would have no authority except the authority that my Father has given you. So he, he has all, he's sovereign, and, and nothing can thwart his plans. Now, I just described God, but I didn't describe anybody here or anybody you know. 
We're not like that. These are the, these are the non-communicable tra communicable traits of God. We can't catch this disease. We can't be infected with those things. However, there are communicable traits. And these are the character and behavior traits of God that we can adapt to because God shares these with his people who reflect his image. So we can catch this. We can get this cold. We can get this virus. And we can be infected with these things. One is his holiness. God is holy and he calls us to be holy. That's a shared trait. His wisdom. We can, we can be wise. We can grow in wisdom. Uh, mercy. We can show mercy and righteousness and justice and wrath, a righteous anger, a moral indignation. We, we can, the Bible says, be angry and do not sin. So, so those, are the, those are the attributes of God that we share. Truthfulness, he only speaks the truth, and so should we. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Did that sound familiar? Where am I getting that? Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit. So, so, in other words, all of these things, these are things that describe God, but they can also describe us, and we should grow in these things. So, when, if you ever hear someone say, well, that's a godly man, or that's a godly woman, what they're saying is, they're like God. They're godlike. Not in the, in the, in the non-communicable trait, that's a hard word to say real fast, not in the non-communicable traits, not in the fact, we're not saying if someone's godly, he knows everything, or she can do anything she pleases, or she, everything, no. But in the, in the communicable traits, we're saying that a person is godly because they're showing God's wisdom, and God's patience, and God's love, and God's mercy. That's what it means to be godly. And so, holiness is a trait of God that we could, and should, and will share if we belong to Him. So, number three then, Growing in holiness is progressive sanctification, and it means that these communicable attributes become more and more manifest in our lives over time. All right, so progressive sanctification. We, in other words, what we're trying to do is grow in wisdom and mercy, righteousness and justice, uh, a holy wrath and grace and truthfulness. Those are the things we want, we want God to work in our lives. All right. So the way we're going to do this is spend the last uh, few minutes of our day together, the Lord's Day, in 1 Peter. Turn with me to 1 Peter, and we'll look at this chunk of Scripture. I'll kind of set it in its context here. Uh, Paul is writing to these believers, and he uh, lists the area Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia. You can, in those maps in the back of your Bible, you can see where all this is. So it's not... This is not one church in one city. These are believers that are scattered out through several through a region of the world, and uh, and and they're mostly most scholars believe they they were Gentiles, and they came from a pretty immoral background, as most Gentiles in the Greco-Roman world uh, that would describe them, and the, and they yet they've heard the gospel and they came to Christ. And First Peter chapter one verse three, blessed. Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. I love that. If you're born again, it's because God caused you to. You didn't cause yourself to be born again. God did it. God did this work. So he goes on in these next few verses to extol the grace of God that saved him and caused him to be born again. And this is what God has done for you. All right, now, now that he's recounted that, this is how God showed his grace. Look at verse 13. Therefore... In other words, therefore, because God has shown his grace to you and caused you to be born again and made you a child of God and adopted you into his family, and now you're his child, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what I'd like to do is give you uh, several reasons here, about eight reasons, why we should pursue holiness, uh, reasons to be holy that we find in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. The first one is this, because when Jesus returns, your struggle will be over, your struggle with sin. So this is an uphill battle, we're fighting sin or struggle, but it's only for a season. It's only for a season. So look at verse 13 again. 
preparing your, preparing your minds, and literally the, the word means to, some of you have uh, translations where it says to gird up your loins, and uh, you know when they wore those long uh, robes and, and, and all that, if they really wanted to get to work, they had to, they had to roll up those things and gird them around their loins so they could walk and work, and what he's saying is get to work. Okay, now that you're saved, God has saved you by his grace, now it's time to get to work in your effort to become holy. And so he says, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace. I don't know about you, but I need hope. Uh, in this effort, I, I, I told you before, I, I don't know why, probably I'm to the age where I start saying things like this, and I, I mentioned this the last several weeks, but, but I just thought I would be farther along in this whole process than I, than I am now. Uh, I thought I'd be more godly. Uh, I thought I would be more holy. And sometimes I think, oh, man, this is so hard. And, and it's easy to lose hope. And the thing that will keep you going is knowing that this isn't forever. This is just for a temporary season, what, what Paul calls a, a momentary and light affliction. This is just, just, is just for a little while compared to all eternity. And, and so you've got, you got the finish line, and the finish line is he talks about the, the appearing of Christ. Christ is coming back. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. That's glorification when he comes again and the resurrection of the body and it's all going to be over and you won't struggle with sin anymore and you won't you know, be battling temptation. And uh, so j- just have hope. Hope is the assurance that no matter how bad it is right now, it's going to get better. All right. So tonight we're going to leave, go back into our, uh, go out in the parking lots, we're going to get back in our cars. And it's going to be cold in our cars, you know, and it's just shivering. And you're going to turn on the, the heat, and it's going to blow cold air out on you and make you even colder. And, and you're going to stay in that car, and the reason is you know you have hope. Even though it's bad now, it's going to get better. It's going to warm up. Unless you got what I got, and from my office, I'll click that little button, and I'll warm up my truck from there, and then I'll walk out there. But that's what, that's what hope is. And so it's like if you ever competed in, in track or you ran any races or 10Ks or marathons, what, what keeps you going? The, the finish line is just up there. It's just up there. This is all going to be over soon. So just hang in there, all right? Just keep fighting. Keep slogging away. We know how this ends. It's going to be ending in victory. We know that Christ is coming again, and that's one of the reasons we keep, keep struggling. When Jesus returns, your struggle will be over. Here's the other thing. Look at number two. Because unholy living is willful disobedience. Look at verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. All right, so what he's saying is the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, before you came to Christ, especially these Gentiles, they just lived ungodly, pagan lives. Now, he says passions, and the, the Greek word there for passions is the word epithumia, and it means, uh, it means cravings, hunger, appetite, the, your former cravings, what you longed for, what you desired. And what they were desiring was all kinds of worldly pleasures. Now, let's, let's be even more specific. That word epithumia is also used in chapter 4, verse 2. Turn to chapter 4, next page, and you see the word again in verse 2. Um, so, let me, let me back up to verse 1 because it's in the middle of a sentence. So, it says in chapter 4, verse 1, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh... Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the human passions, there's the word, epithemia, same word that's used in chapter 1, passions, but for the will of God. Okay, so these passions are not the will of God, they're your will, but not God's will. Now that you're a Christian, conform your will to God's will. Verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in, now here's a list, sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Now consider some of those here. For instance, sensuality means, it, it means it's just a license to obey your, your sensual desires. It, it means you can just follow whatever, whatever your, your desires are, you follow that. You feel, and so you have a license to do that, sensuality. Passions and cravings. Drunkenness. 
drunkenness. And notice, not only drunkenness, but the next thing is orgies. And that also is a word in the Greek that has to do with, it was a word that described uh, the, the pagan parties and parades that would happen usually late at night. And uh, there would be a lot of drinking and they would, there would be a lot of music and they would like move down through the streets and uh, they would celebrate all these things. And it was, you know, everybody was drinking. In fact, when I, when I studied that Greek word, I think of New Orleans at Mardi Gras. That's basically kind of the sense that was going on here. So you got, you got a lot of partying and a lot of drinking. He said, that's the way you used to live. And then again, the next one is drinking parties. And so you got three right in a row that have some kind of connection to alcohol. And he's given them a very serious warning about this. Now, just to, re to remind you, the, the position on the Bible with regard to, to alcohol is that um, on, on one side, it's got, you got some guard. The Bible does not prohibit the, the use of alcohol in moderation. Uh, Jesus, when this is his first miracle, was turning water into wine. It was real wine, and Jesus drank alcohol. But, but what this is describing is uh, alcohol in excess. So you've got several positions that you can take that are available to you. One is you can, you can say, you know, I know me, I know my family, I know our history, uh, I know my past, uh, I, I got this situation, it's just best for me not to drink alcohol. And that would be a legitimate position to take and probably a good one for a lot of Christians. Some Christians could take the other positions. Uh, I don't have a problem with it, haven't exhibited a problem with it, and so in moderation, every now and then, maybe a glass of wine with your meal or something like that, but in moderation. What the Bible does prohibit is alcohol in excess, and that's always tricky, defining that, right? So what is excess? And it's going to be different for different people. It's going to be different for men than it is for women. It's, it's, uh, and especially, we know, we know what it does to younger people in terms of their brain activity and, and the damage that that could cause. And even, that's why we say you've got to be 21, and we, we make laws like this. But w the reason the warnings are there through all of Scripture is because alcohol in particular, and by the way, uh, alcohol is the second most addictive substance on the planet. Number one is heroin, and then comes alcohol. And anyone in our church in law enforcement will tell you that often when they're looking at crimes that have been committed in our community, there is almost always a connection to either alcohol or drugs. And the reason is alcohol has always been and will always be in excess a lubricant for sin. It, it, it's, it just makes it easy to be unholy. It makes it easy to lie. It makes it easy. The whole Me Too movement, nobody wants to talk about this. And I, I mentioned this morning that it did, does fall, the responsibility falls on the men in the culture to protect women. And that is true. But if you're not teaching your daughters to be smart, then that's unwise. There's certain places that you should not be if you are a woman. And there are people that you should not be with and there are activities that you should not be involved with. And if you follow those rules, the chances of you be set, being sexually assaulted goes down considerably. You, you hang out with young guys who are drinking, you're asking for trouble. You, you hang out with men who try to get you to drink a lot, you're asking for trouble. So, so what he's saying here is holiness means in, in this aspect, you've got to be aware all the time. This is an area that you have to be careful in. So he says, this is the way you used to live. And, and, and it, it doesn't help you be holy. I, I've never heard anyone say to me, man, I was really struggling in my Christian life. I was really finding it hard to be holy until I started drinking. And then everything just got so much better. And I've never had a woman say to me, hey, our marriage was in trouble. But, but then my husband started drinking. And then it, everything just is fine. Nobody says that. So, so this, is why, this is why we have to consider that this is a big part, and it was a big issue for them. And it's a big issue for us in our, in our culture. When we send our kids off to university, this is, these are realities. Um, the, other, the next thing is idolatry. And, and idolatry is anything, as you know, a, an idol is anything that we put in a place of God, any created thing. And it, it might be, it might be uh, a person, and it might be a thing, but he says that this is the way you used to live, drinking parties and lawless idolatry. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, statues, the pagan gods that they worshipped. It might be the emperor Caesar was worshipped. It, it might be good things. It, sports can become an idol. And to a large degree in our culture have become an idol. Sports are good things. I love sports, but it can become an idol. 
Children can become an idol. Children can take center stage and you know, children can become more important to you than God and your own holiness. And we see that happening in our culture as well. And so, you know, we've got to make sure they're happy and we do all these activities and they become the center and, and, and it's a child-centered family instead of a God-centered family. So, so, so he's saying, this is what it means. This is what I mean when I talk about your former passions and ignorance. Look at verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. So what he's saying is, you, when you got saved, it, you might have been the only one in your group that got saved. So all your buddies, they're still pagans. And then you came to Christ, and, and all of a sudden you're not much fun anymore. And they let you have it. And so they malign you. They, they say bad things about you. They say, what's wrong with you? You know? You're not, you're not even funny anymore. Why you do? And then they get angry with you because here you are trying to be holy. And guess what? The world doesn't want you to be holy. You, you're going you're gonna to stop the drinking parties. And, and, and you're going to stop sleeping around. And, and you're going to stop using profanity and using God's name. And you're just not going to be any fun. And they're going to malign you. And that pressure... You're not going to get any. You're not going to get any encouragement from this world to be holy. So, so Karen Pence, the vice president's wife, gets a job in the school, Christian school, where her kids graduated years ago, and where she used to work as a as an art instructor back when uh, Vice President Pence was in Congress, and and that becomes a huge news story. They're not saying, hey, it's great that, that she's gone back, that she's not dependent on the vice president, that she's actually going into the work world and she's using her. No, you know what the story was. You saw it, didn't you? The story is they found out this Christian school defines marriage as one man and one woman for life, and therefore the expectation of students and teachers is that they not be involved in sexual activity outside of marriage like premarital sex or homosexual sexual activity. In other words, I read their policy. It sounds just like the policy of First Bible Church, and she's getting crucified just because she's teaching art there. So, so what I'm saying is, if you want to be holy, that's what you can expect. They will malign you. You know, they, they, they would want you, they want you to go along with them. The world wants you to come along with them, and you just, you can't. But here's what you got to remember. Look at verse 5. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. So all the people maligning you and all the people saying bad things about you and, you know, giving your kids a hard time because they're trying to be holy and live holy lives, they're going to stand before God, and they'll give an account to him. You let God deal with them. Verse 6, for this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That is, they, they came to Christ, and now they're dead, and, and now they're alive with God in heaven. So that's, that's an idea of this word epithumia. That's what it means, the passions that he says that you, have, that you have now turned your back on, and the world's not going to really love you for it. All right, so number now we're back to the handout. 4.3, another reason to be holy, because the God who has called you is holy. Look at verse 15 and 16. But he, as he who called you is holy, this is chapter 1 now again, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Quoting here Le uh, Leviticus, Leviticus 11.44. So, so the reason we're to be holy is because the God who called us is holy. And remember what? We're, we're his children. And how, how is it that your family is going to be happy? What, describe a happy family. And I'll tell you, a happy family is when you've got good, wise, strong parents and children who obey them. And if you don't obey those parents, you're not going to have a happy family. And God, the God who called you is holy, and he's saying, come near to me. Draw near to me. I want to be close to you. Come near to me. But the only way you're going to enjoy the presence of God, who is holy, is if you two are holy. That's how you enjoy God's presence. So if you want to enjoy 
his presence and you want to get close to him and you want to, to enjoy communion with him, you have to be holy because he is holy. 4.4, 4. another reason to be holy is because you should fear the discipline, though not the wrath, of your father. Look at verse 17 and 18. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. So, so conduct yourselves with fear. We should live in the fear of the Lord. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. It, we're not fearing the wrath of God, the punishment of God, but it is proper to fear the, the discipline of God because he's your father. And whom the Lord loves, he disciplines as a father disciplines his son, right? And so we live in this, if he's, if he's sovereign and if he's in control and if he's omnipotent, then he sure, certainly is able to, to, to discipline us. And how does he do it? All sorts of ways. Uh, if, if, we keep, if we keep rebelling against him, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that ultimately some rebelled against God so much in the church that he took their lives. Uh, he can discipline us in uh, sicknesses and disease. This doesn't, now this is, you've got to be careful with this. It doesn't mean if anyone gets sick it's because they're under God's discipline. But it does mean that sometimes that's the way God disciplines us and humbles us and corrects us and brings us, brings us back. That's why it says in James, if anyone wants the elders to come pray for them and, and anoint them with oil and pray for, for their healing, the first thing they have to do is, it says there in a passage that they've got to confess their sins to God uh, because in, in case that this is God's discipline in their life. Or he'll, he'll allow some failure in your life or bring someone in your life who just kind of you'll think, why did that happen? And you'll realize that was God, you know, correcting you. I mean, I was a freshman in college uh, years ago, and, um, uh, but, but when I was in high school, let me back up a little bit. When I was in high school, we, we lived out in the country, uh, outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, it's all, it's all development now, but it was, it was, we lived out in the sticks, and I mean, I had a rifle range in my backyard, and then I had a trail out in my backyard into the woods, and I had a trap line, and I would trap, because uh, my uncle was a trapper, and I, he, was, he was like my hero, and he taught me how to trap, and I would trap, you know, fox, and that sort of thing, and skin, the whole idea was, I'd trap muskrat, and so I knew, I had traps, and I knew how to trap, and uh, so I go to college my freshman year, and uh, uh, you know, you're trapped in classrooms all day and you want to be outside and, and the college was kind of out near a rural area and there's a guy in my uh, class and we were talking about trapping. He said, oh, we ought to do that. Well, a trapping license in North Carolina was pretty expensive and uh, we knew this, this stream, this area where we thought that looks like a good place to put a trap line. And, uh, and here's how we reasoned it. Uh, because the trapping license is so expensive, Let's put out some traps first and see if there's anything out there. And then if we catch something, we'll go get our license. Now, I know you've never thought like that before, but we thought it was a pretty good idea. So we drive out there to this area, and uh, I had a bunch of traps in the back of the truck and buckets and all the equipment and stuff and the drag chains, and, and we started setting traps. And uh, we set a few, and we came back to the truck, and... My truck was on the side of the road, this, this country road, and when we got up there, there was another truck behind my truck, and it was beautiful forest green truck. <laughs> and it had a little seal on the, on the, the driver's side and on the passenger side. Uh, the North Carolina Department of Game, Fish, and Wildlife. And there was a guy, I mean, he fit the part too. He's a perfect, you know, game warden guy. And I was a freshman in college, and I was scared. I was really scared. And we go up to the truck, and he looks in the back of the truck, and he sees those traps. And uh, fortunately, I don't know, God was just merciful to me because he did not ask me outright uh, if we'd set some traps. He just said to us, college boys, let's take a walk. And uh, he walked back into the woods where we had just been because he's looking for where we set the traps and I'm just following the game warden along. He says, y'all know you need a license to trap. I said, yes, sir. And he said, have a good day. And he walked away. 
So you know what I did? I said, Lord, I'm sorry. And I wouldn't pull every single trap because I was not going to test the patience of the Lord too much. We had never, ever seen a game warden in that area before. And we never saw a game warden afterwards the whole time I was a student there. Did God send him? Absolutely. And, and God will do that to his children. I can't get away with anything. I, I can't. I get caught at everything. I learned that a long time ago. That's what God, God loves us that much. He said, well, I've never been disciplined by the Lord. Uh-oh. That's not good. Because the Lord disciplines his children. See? He can discipline you in a sermon. You, you, you'll be sitting in, 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 a, in church, and through his word, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and brings conviction onto your heart and you're sitting there and you feel like you're going to have to be scraped off the seat with a putty knife because you know God's speaking to you he wants you to correct something and you say man it's been a long time since I felt that I'm sorry here, here's the danger here's the danger of being in a place like First Bible Church we just we're just so used to good sound teaching. Go to our ABF, we get good sound teaching, and you know, and, and every sermon, you know, we're going to open up the Word, and we're going to work through a passage of Scripture, and and uh, you got you go in your small groups, and you're studying really great stuff because you know we we Vance Helms will make sure you get the right curriculum, and 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 then your heart starts to get calloused, and you get insensitive, and and you stop feeling like God's messing with you. Let me just say something. It's a really good feeling when God messes with you. When he convicts you. When he puts, when he puts conviction on your heart for some sin in your life, that's a good feeling. It's, just, it's a bad feeling, but it's a good feeling. You know why it's good? He loves you that much. That's how much he loves you. And, and if you haven't felt that in a while, it's not because you have reached perfection. It's because you're not listening. And, and this is why we've really got to be careful with this. This is, this is what God is doing in our lives. He's trying to get our attention. He, we need to fear Him. Do you not fear Him anymore? And you need to cry out to God, Please, give me fear. Give me fear of your discipline. I don't, I don't want to disobey you. I don't want to be unholy. All right, here's 4.5. Because unholiness is stupid. <laughs> I love it. I just, I, I've always said I'm going to write a book. Uh, sin is stupid. And I think I can make the case that it is. Look at what it says in verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold. Your forefathers, your Gentile forefathers, and you know they, they, were, they were pagans and they passed down all these, this idol worship and all this immorality and all this way of living. You got that from them, and, but it's futile. The, the word for futile means it, it's, it's empty. It's, it's devoid of truth and success. It's often translated in the New Testament as useless. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, remember when Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless. That's the word that's used here. It's futile. It's stupid. You're, you're stupid to be a Christian if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead. And it's, it, there's just an emptiness there. Um, he, what he's saying is this way of life, the, the drunkenness, the sexual immorality, the, the, the seeking the, the sensual pleasures, and, and all these things that you're chasing after, just think about it for a second. How do you feel the next morning? You wake up the next morning. Do you wake up thinking, man, I'm glad I did that? Or, or do you wake up with regret, regret and remorse and a sense of futility? I mean, suicide in the United States is growing. You, you would think, oh, the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth, we've got all this stuff, we can do whatever we want, we've got all this sexual freedom, people should be more happy. They're not happy. Because it's futile. It's empty. 
and, uh, and there's regret and there's remorse. You'll never get to the end of your life and say, man, I wish I had sinned more. I wish I'd gotten drunk more. I wish I'd drank more. I wish I had slept with more people. That You'll never say that. It, there's futility to it. So, so it's stupid. It's like uh, if someone came to you and they said, look, I got, I'm going to start this business. I want you, I'm going to give you a chance to get in on it. And, and in fact, I'm going to ask you to give your life savings, everything you got to this business. And you say, okay, what's the business? What's your, what's your plan? What's your model? And he says, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use your money to, to pay people to go collect all these empty water bottles because there are gazillion empty plastic water bottles all over the United States right now. And we're going to get all these water bottles. And then we're going to open up the lid on these empty water bottles. And we're going to scoop up air. And we're going to put the lid on this water bottle. And we're going to sell air. And you say, oh, well, here's my life savings. You know what that is? That's stupid. That's futile. That's the word that he's talking about. So, so this life of unholiness, which, which is easy to live, is, is futile. He says it's a futile life. It's, it's empty. And then 4.6, because Jesus came and died and was buried and raised to make you holy. That's the whole point. That's why he came. Look at verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. There's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why he came. He came to buy us and so he could make us holy, holy. Jesus didn't come to do social justice. Jesus didn't come to, to ensure racial reconciliation. Jesus didn't come to feed the hungry. He didn't come. His mission, the, Jesus didn't come to this earth to, to, to clothe the naked and help the poor. And the, the Great Commission does not say, go therefore and help the poor. Jesus came to die. He came to spill his blood and to purchase us and redeem us and change us. Now, as a result of what he did for us, yes, we'll help the poor. Yes, we'll do social justice. Yes, we'll be involved in racial reconciliation. But the reason Jesus came was for this, to make us holy. 4.7, because your holiness is an act of love toward other people. Verse 22 says this, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. When you pursue holiness, you're loving your neighbor. What kind of neighbor do you want? Don't you want a neighbor who tells the truth all the time? Don't you, don't you want a neighbor who, who is committed to marriage? And don't you want a neighbor who, 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 who doesn't abuse alcohol or drugs? I mean, that pursuing holiness is loving. It's the loving thing that we do. And then... Not only that, number eight, because you were born again, re uh, regenerated to start growing in holiness. This is why you're born again. Verse 23, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of, of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. All flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fa falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. This is why we're born again, is so that we could be holy. All right, a couple of co closing thoughts. Number one, um, I'm looking out on a crowd right now, and the last thing I, the last, uh, the last thing I would do is describe you as a bunch of wild partiers, all right? Except Bob Dishman, he's crazy. <laughs> you know, I don't know if any of you've been on to any orgies lately. You know, held any wild drinking parties. Um, so you could look at this and say, man, I'm holy. I don't, I've, 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 I've gone beyond all of these things. But here's the danger. Holiness is not just external. I, I, look, at, I look at you, I see some of the most upstanding citizens in Decatur. I see holy people. I see sacred people. We, these, this is, you're good people. I, I know you are. I know, I'm, I'm looking out here, I know all of you. Um, and yet, I always think of what Jesus said about the Pharisees. When, when he was talking to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, you know, remember what he called them? He said, you're, 
your whitewashed sepulchers. And what he, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem, uh, that they, they would bury people in bone boxes, that these, these stone boxes that are, that, that are above the ground, they're sepulchers. And, and he says, on the outside, your whitewashed sepulcher, he said, inside your bones and flesh and corruption and death. So I know, I know you on the outside, but God knows you on the inside. And, and he cares about the inside just as much as he cares the outside. And the other thing is, you say, well, these are big sins, and I used to do the big sins, but I just, now I got it down to where I'm doing the little sins. So let me just tell you about the little sins. They'll catch up with you. I was watching uh, National Geographic's last couple nights ago, and they had this special, some of you probably have seen it on Air Force One, where they go behind the scenes on Air Force One, and it is fascinating. And they, they tell you how, how they do things, how they manage things, when they go into especially war zones, and, and uh, they take you inside all, the, just the guts of Air Force One. And, and so one of the mechanics was standing next to a, a, the turbine jet, and you know, inside the turbine you got the, you got the, parallels of fans that and, and he said the the thing we worry about the most is sand he said sand he, they fly into places you know that where the, the sand comes in and you suck in the sand he says the sand will just kind of eat away at those propellers inside that turbine and and he says next starts these, these little fractures and then if one of those chips off then that gets into the turbine and it eats the whole thing out you lose the whole engine he says that that's why we inspect this all the time he said this plane could be taken down by a grain of sand Isn't that interesting so brothers and sisters let's watch the little sins too the little sins we just kind of tolerate and we let them hang out there because they're not they're not real big sins right they're not this stuff be careful. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, we pray that you would give us a desire for holiness. Uh, it starts with you. We wouldn't even desire it. We wouldn't even want to be holy if you didn't do a work in our hearts. And uh, we pray that we'd be mindful, too, of, of the way you speak to us in circumstances and situations, the way you bring discipline into our life, uh, failures, uh, sickness, all kinds of things to get our attention to cause us to uh, come back to you and this week also help us to be mindful and sensitive to that your Holy Spirit would convict us of the little sins in our life that we've just kind of tolerated. I pray that you would uh, do your holy work in our lives for your sake and for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. You're dismissed.